point in time had been in negotiations with Hammer Films to continue the Dracula series of pictures. Uh, and the third film with Lee as the Count goes into production. Uh, Terence Fisher uh, had composed his own particular brand of romanticism in Dracula, 1958, and Dracula, Prince of Darkness, 1965. But sadly, Hammer handed over the third installment to the workmanlike but uh, often uninspired Freddie Francis. Francis proceeded to string together largely arbitrary, though sometimes well-composed and atmospheric scenes with a considerably increased sexual element uh, for its own sake, regardless of how such scenes related to the vampire story. Dracula has risen from the grave. 1968 begins well with two priests fighting their way through a storm up to the looming castle Dracula to fix a golden cross on its gate. As one of them falls through the ice that covers the Count's body, uh, Lee had fallen through water at the end of the previous outing, the blood of the priest's wounds revives the vampire. Now, the Monsignor, played by Rupert Davies, becomes Dracula's main antagonist as the Count enslaves Xena, uh, Barbara Hewing, uh, a busty and beautiful babe, and lusts after, uh, he, uh, Dracula lusts after Mara, uh, Maria, played by the, uh, well, unbelievably beautiful Veronica Carlson, uh, whose buxom figure is literally ripping through her bodice corset. Uh, Dracula, Lee, scampers over the rooftops in order to reach her window and quickly abducts her and forces her uh, to remove the cross barring entry to his castle uh, and to throw it into the abyss. Uh, shortly after Count Dracula, Lee is uh, pushed into the same abyss and is impaled on the fateful crucifix. Now, the most memorable scene has Dracula, Lee, pulling the stake from his own body, a scene which the actor protested at the time. Now, Barbara Ewing is excellent as the serving wench, dying with an orgasmic expression of satisfied lust. Uh, but the glow of repressed sensuality appropriate to Dracula's Victorian-era victims and was so excellently conveyed in Terence Fisher's first two Dracula movies, is sadly lost by Freddie Francis. Dracula Has Risen from the Grave increases the explicit depiction of sexual themes. Uh, the vampire's victims slash lovers begin to react to the Count's uh, signaling. Uh, they're reacting to the Count signaling their participation in the event, and experiencing a big sexual thrill flummet. Uh, this becomes more explicit. The vampire's bite becomes more of a sexual give and take in this movie. Now, the final, and uh, as well as Peter Cushing returning uh, to his famous role of the Baron Dr. von Frankenstein. All right, uh, Drink the Blood of Dracula. Uh, this is the fourth in the Hammer series, uh, 1969, directed by Peter Sadsky. Well, a year after Dracula has risen from the grave, Hammer produced this intriguing film, which for the first time locates Count Dracula squarely within the culture of Victorian England. Uh, the movie tells the tale of the depraved Lord Courtney, uh, played by Ralph Bates. Uh, Bates would soon become Hammer's new leading man, uh, and, well, to put it uh, bluntly, Bates was a poor substitute for Peter Cushing. Uh, well, Lord Courtley is a member of British royalty uh, who witnessed Count Dracula's demise and collects several of his possessions, including Dracula's cloak, ring, and a vial of his blood, uh, which the depraved Bates treats as holy relics. Uh, Lord Courtley, Bates, uh, in a magical ritual ceremony uh, and a prolonged and dramatically shot sequence inside a derelict church, attempts to resurrect the Count 
of course, Christopher Lee, by drinking his blood. Uh, the magical rite works. works. Uh, Dracula rises and is reborn, uh, but at the cost of his benefactor, Bates's life. Now, three men uh, who witnessed the resurrection, uh, Victorian gentlemen out for kicks, uh, played by Jeffrey Keen, uh, John uh, Carson, and Peter Salas, get more than they bargained for and flee the church, uh, but manage to steal his uh, Dracula's cloak and ring, uh, leaving the corpse of Bates far behind. Uh, the Count, uh, Christopher Lee, revenges the death of his servant and the stealing of his prized possessions uh, by seducing the children of the three Victorian gentlemen, uh, Anthony Colon, uh, Colon, excuse me, uh, Linda Hayden, and Ilsa Blair. Uh, and Dracula has them kill their own hypocritical fathers, uh, making this the first Hammer Dracula uh, the first Hammer Dracula film since Terrence Fitcher's uh, launched a series in 58 that explicitly designates the vampire count as symbolic for the forces that threaten uh, the, uh, well, ideal of the Victorian era family. Uh, count Dracula, Christopher Lee, represents, uh, well, an aristocratic run amuck notion of sexuality. Uh, which must be repressed if the Victorian family is to survive. Uh, the Count's hypnotic, seductive powers transform the two repressed daughters into passionately sensual creatures. Uh, Rithering in ecstasy uh, on Dracula's tombstone, for example, and gleefully staking the man who came to stake the vampire. Uh, the interaction between Dracula and his female victims suggests a conscious use of vampirism as a symbol responding uh, to the new attitudes about sexuality then developing in the late 1960s. Uh, Dracula, Lee, is destroyed as he cuts himself, slashing the cobwebbed church's stained glass window which features a prominent cross. Uh, this was Hungarian-born Peter Satsky's first feature film, uh, and the movie suggested that he might be a worthy successor uh, to the great but aging Terence Fisher. Uh, Satsky's romanticism is flamboyant, and the director uses la uh, luscious, lavish colors and elegant camera movements just like Fisher. Uh, his next film's for Hammer, the excellent Countess uh, Dracula, 1971, with Ingrid Pitt, uh, and the pretty good Hands of the Ripper, confirmed him as one of the few directors then working in England who prized cinematic values over literary ones. Unfortunately, uh, well, his work, his later work, was disappointing, uh, and Sadsky never lived up uh, to his great promise or potential. Now, Peter uh, Cushing and Christopher Lee. Lee, Christopher Lee soon works again with director Jesus Franco in a film that was promoted as the first faithful adaptation of Bram Stoker's novel. Uh, this is Count Dracula, 1970, uh, which has a numerous, uh, numerous other titles. Uh, it's also known as The Knights of Dracula, Dracula 71, and Bram Stoker's Count Dracula. Uh, however you want to call it, uh, this movie is a disappointment. Uh, the film is set in Budapest. The Count uh, Lee, Christopher Lee, is eventually destroyed by peasants who set fire to his coffin. Uh, Dracula in the film is depicted as a mustached Hungarian uh, Magyar noble who grows younger uh, as he intakes blood. But there the resemblance to Bram Stoker's character and novel ends. Uh, the dialogue is stilted, and the relentless use of the zoom lens uh, by uh, director uh, Jesus Franco, together with the repetition of identical cutaway shots, ruined the film's rhythm and atmosphere. Uh, an eply done day-for-night shooting, uh, cardboard rocks uh, bouncing around the set, and squirts of red paint 
uh, accompanying the staking of vampires pushed the movie into involuntary parody. Only Klaus Kinsey's maniacal portrayal of Renfield provides some great moments. Uh, both Christopher Lee and Herbert Lom, who plays Van Helsing, uh, give workmanlike performances but cannot save the film. Now, the Spanish avant-garde filmmaker Pedro Portabella uh, was granted access to the sets used in the movie and produced a far more interesting film, a documentary fantasy called Vampire. Uh, this was released in 1971. Vampire is a poetic meditation on the vampire genre itself. Uh, it's made as a silent film uh, with an interesting soundtrack, a combination of noises, uh, music, and Lee's voiceover narration. Uh, Lee reads the passages from Stoker's novel, which describe Count Dracula's death. Uh, Portobello's avant-garde film revels in images of death and decay, uh, evoking dim memories uh, of the vaults of dusty film archives. Uh, Portobello and Lee had worked together before uh, the previous year in El Umbracal, uh, another fantasy poem slash documentary, uh, this time about the actor himself, uh, with Christopher Lee reciting Poe's The Raven uh, and singing opera excerpts uh, while wandering about in, uh, in the city of Barcelona. Uh, Barcelona in the film uh, is transformed by Portobello and Lee into a city of enchanted dreams. Uh, Lee and Cushing, next co-star in a very popular anthology horror 